Welcome to the Justice Committee's 10th meeting of 2009. We have apologies from Jenny Gilruth, and I welcome Big Kid, Bill Kidd, who is substituting for Jenny today, and invite Bill to declare any relevant interests. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. I don't believe I have any relevant interest to declare at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Um, agenda item one is a decision on whether to take item five, which is consideration of a draft letter in private. Are we all agreed? Yes. Are all agreed. Thank you. Agenda item two is an evidence session on an affirmative instrument, services of lawyers and lawyers practice, EU exit Scotland amendment, etc. Regulations 2019 draft. And I welcome Ash Denham. Minister for Community Safety and her officials, Denise Swanson, and Emma Stevenson, Director of Legal Services uh, with the Scottish Government. Uh, this item is a chance for members to seek clarification of any points on the instrument from the Minister and officials before we formally dispose of it. I refer members to paper one, which is a note by the clerk, and paper one also contains a written statement uh, submission from the Law Society of Scotland on the SSI. Minister, do you wish to make a short opening statement on the instrument? I do. Thank you, Convener. Yeah. So, because it might be helpful to set out the context in which this SSI has been laid. So, the Services of Lawyers and Lawyers' Practice Amendment, etc., EU Exit Scotland Regulations 2019, have been developed to prepare for a no deal Brexit. And this instrument mirrors the approach that has been taken in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Currently, EU directives set out the rights of lawyers to provide legal services in EU and EFTA states. The current application of those EU directives allows specified lawyers to provide regulated services in a member state other than the one in which they qualified, and that's termed a host state, without the need to register with the host state regulator. Lawyers provide services under their existing professional title, which is otherwise termed their home state professional title. The directive clarifies the regulatory rules that are applicable and the conditions for providing those services in a host state, and these are commonly known as fly-in, fly-out services. The Lawyers' Establishment Directive allows specified lawyers in one member state to practice reserved legal activities on a permanent basis in another member state under their home state professional title and the conditions for doing so. It also allows lawyers who are practising in another member state to be admitted to the profession in that member state after three years of practice in the law of that member state without having to go through the usual qualification routes. European lawyers practising in Scotland under the Establishment Directive must be registered with a Scottish regulator as registered European lawyers. As registered European lawyers, they have the right to own legal businesses without a UK qualified lawyer. The purpose of the instrument is to end the preferential practising rights of EU and EFTA lawyers in Scotland to provide legal services on either a permanent or a temporary basis. In the event of a no-deal Brexit, the reciprocal arrangements that are enjoyed by members of the EU and EFTA will no longer be available to the UK. EU and EFTA qualified lawyers who have already successfully transferred into the Scottish qualification will be able to retain their qualification and practice rights, but arrangements will be different in the future. In the event that the UK leaves the EU without a deal, our services trading relationship with the EU will be governed by World Trade Organisation rules. The General Agreement on Trade and Services prohibits signatory states from giving preferential market access to any other signatory state in the absence of a comprehensive free trade or recognition agreement between them. We therefore need to fix the deficiencies in the relevant retained EU law caused by the lack of reciprocal arrangements with the EU, while also meeting our international obligations. And as such, we will revoke the legislation that currently implements the EU framework and EU and EFTA lawyers will be treated in the same way as other third country lawyers. The draft statutory instrument will helpfully provide a transition period to allow registered European lawyers from EU and EFTA states time to comply with the new regulatory position. And the transition period will run from exit day until the 31st of December 2020. It will allow registered European lawyers and those in the process of achieving registered European law lawyer status by exit day to practice in the same way as they do now, but with time to adjust. 
In making these amendments, the instrument recognises the terms of the agreement between the UK Government and the Swiss um, Confederation on Citizens' Rights, following withdrawal of the UK from the EU, and provision is made for reciprocal rights of practice within the terms of that agreement. So this is a no-deal SSI, and obviously that is not the Scottish Government's preferred position. We regret the decision to leave the EU and wouldn't support a no-deal Brexit. However, it is incumbent upon us to prepare for all potential outcomes, and we have to consider the best approach in this area should the UK leave the EU without a deal. Officials have kept in close contact with the relevant representative organisations, so the Law Society of Scotland and the Faculty of Advocates, who are aware of this instrument and have also contributed to the Business Regulatory Impact Assessment. It is thought that the terms of the instrument will have little impact on the current landscape for delivery of legal services. So, convener, I'm grateful for having this opportunity to provide some context about the SSI, and I'd be happy to take any questions that the committee might have on it. Uh, thank you very much for that comprehensive statement. Liam MacArthur. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. That was uh, a, a helpful clarification of the position we find ourselves in. I think we've all rehearsed at various stages the, the arguments about um, not wishing it to be in this position. I welcome the fact that there's um, seems to be a sensible um, period during which uh, any uh, reorganisation of affairs can take place. I think that that is also very sensible. But uh, I, I think um, moving away from a system of mutual recognition is just a further example of, of how uh, bad and unnecessarily bad uh, this situation uh, is. I, I would also like to, I think, put on record um, uh, gratitude to the Law Society for their uh, helpful note. And I think it's also worth reflecting that uh, in their submission, uh, they go on to say, uh, we fully intend whatever the future relationship with the EU after exit to keep uh, open, accessible, yet robust routes to requalification for lawyers from any jurisdiction uh, which allow them to practice within Scotland whilst also reassuring clients of their competence. And I think that, uh, that assurance is also uh, very welcome indeed. Um, but as I say, this is highly regrettable where uh, we are in this position, but this, uh, the, uh, the, the SI we're looking at appears to um, discharge the, the responsibilities that, that need to be just discharged and therefore be supporting it. Okay. Do members have any other comments or questions? In that case, agenda item three is formal consideration of the motion in relation to the affirmative instrument. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has considered and reported on the instrument and has no comments on it. The motion will be moved with an opportunity for a formal debate if that's necessary. The motion is motion 16239 that the Justice Committee recommends that the services of lawyers and lawyers practice EU exit Scotland amendment etc regulations 2019 draft be approved. Minister to move. Moved. Thank you. Um, do members have any further comments or questions? In that case, I put the question, is motion 16239 in the name of Ashtenham approved? Yes. It is yes. approved. Thank you. Um, is the committee content to delegate authority to me as convener to clear the final draft of the report? Yes. Thank you. We well, it only remains me to to thank the minister and our officials for attending and suspend briefly to allow the minister to leave. Agenda item four is consideration of three negative instruments, police pensions, miscellaneous amendments, Scotland regulations 2019, SSI 2019 oblique 68, Act of Sederant, Taxation of Judicial Expenses Rules 2019 SSI 2019 oblique 75, Legal Aid and Advice and Assistance Scotland Miscellaneous Amendments Regulations 2019 SSI 2019 oblique 78. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has considered and reported on 
all three instruments and um, has no comments on any of them. Sorry, I beg your pardon, Kevin. I, I just wish to refer members to my register of interest as a recipient of a police pension in respect of the item on the agenda. <coughs> okay, duly noted. Um, I refer members to paper two, which is a note by the clerk. Members, we wish to note that in relation to the SSI on legal aid, SSI 2019 oblique 78, we have also received written submissions from the Law Society of Scotland and the Edinburgh Bar Association. Those submissions are attached to the paper on the SSIs. Do members have any comments on the instruments? And Liam and Daniel. Uh, I have questions on the first instrument and the third instrument, actually. I'll do the first, the, the one on the police pensions first, if I may, uh, and then come in after Daniel, perhaps. Uh, just simply that uh, my understanding from reading this is that there will be an increase in the police employer contribution to the pension. That uh, estimated cost is about £40 million, and that the Treasury, the UK Treasury, covers that increase, uh, but that there was supposed to be confirmation in the spring statement. Uh, could, do, do we know what that confirmation was? Do we have confirmation? Uh, I don't have that information to hand, but as the committee is considering the rest of the instruments, we'll see if we can find that out for you. I'll be very grateful. Thank okay. you. Daniel? Um, thank you, Kavina. I, mean, I just think that the, the two items that were submitted by the Edinburgh Bar Association and the Law Society regarding legal aid uh, were quite strong submissions, and I think it's particularly worth noting that it, you know, it's not usual for us to get submissions for negative instruments such as those. And I think the points that they make regarding the situation legal aid find itself are, are um, certainly... Uh, I think worth us noting, and I was wondering whether or not some of the points that they raise might be worth writing to the Minister asking for any comment on the Government, in particular the, the statement by uh, the Edinburgh Bar Association that, uh, that there's been a total reduction of 31% since 2011 in the, the funding available to a, a criminal legal aid solicitors, uh, and, and likewise the, the Law Society's call for a, uh, a full kind of needs-based review um, as part of the, the, the future structures that may come out of the, the legal aid review that the, the Scottish Government's um, currently conducting. And, and I think those, amongst other points, are uh, worth us noting and thinking about whether or not we might want to, to act on them. Right, thank you. Uh, Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you very much. I entirely agree with uh, Daniel Johnson. It is unusual for us to get submissions of this sort in relation to negative instruments, although probably not, not wholly surprising uh, in the context of um, the debate there's been around uh, legal aid. I don't think it should, um, it, it should interfere. In fact, I think Edinburgh Bar Association goes as far as to say it shouldn't interfere with the passing of this SI, but I think there is a bit of work uh, to be done there, partly on the, the, the point that um, Daniel Johnson's raised in relation to um, the, the, the drop in legal aid practitioners. I raised it in the in uh, the chamber last week with the, the minister, there are parts of the country now where um, the, the accessibility of legal aid practitioners is a serious problem. Uh, in, uh, in Orkney, I know many have to seek legal representation uh, from lawyers based on the Scottish mainland, which is often leading to them not actually having contact uh, between client and lawyer until the day they, they appear in court, which doesn't seem to be um, uh, desirable at all. Um, but I think the other point that Edinburgh Bar Association made that, that leapt out at me was um, referring to the underspending money allocated for police station work, which um, you recall, uh, convener, there was quite a bit of controversy around when that came through the um, through the committee. So I think there's there's probably a number of, of, of different issues we I think could very usefully um, follow up with the uh, with the Scottish government and use um, the passing of this SI as a as a, as a peg on which to, to hang that. Okay, um, Rona. Thank you, convener. Yeah, I think I mean these are you know very valid and uh, important points raised, but I think it's also worth noting that the Faculty of Advocates welcomed the three percent increase and that in England and Wales they've just announced a 1% increase only for barristers, and that Scotland's current legal aid spend per head is the third highest in the European Union and is the widest scope in eligibility. So just by way of balance, I wanted to get that on record. OK, thank you. And John Finney? Um, thank you, Kevin. The, the facts that Rona McKay mentions may well be the case, but I think there are genuine concerns about the wider implications of this and the much-used phrase, access to justice, and the circumstances outlined by my colleague, Lee MacArthur. 
the frustration is that this falls comes not long after a, a significant review of the process. So, at the very least, I would like to see us write to um, the Cabinet Secretary for Justice and ask for a response to the specific points raised in the two submissions we've received, which are rightly don't want the issue stopped, they want it proceeded, but I, I think the issues remain. Yeah, and Liam Kerr? Thank you, Convener. Yes, I want to specifically endorse uh, the points that have been made. I, I must declare an interest, of course, at the outset. I'm a practicing, uh, I have a practising certificate with the Law Society of England and Wales and of Scotland. Um, but I think it is very important, some of these issues that have been raised. Particularly, I think we should find out if the uh, government concedes the level of hardship that uh, the Bar Association have uh, flagged up and the numbers departing, particularly because it has a, or they, they suggest it has a gendered nature to it. Um, and, and I was also quite interested, because I've only been here uh, three years now, uh, about this business of a promise made in 2011 to reinstate the uh, funding, which certainly the allegation seems to be that that promise has been broken. And I'm quite interested to know more about that uh, or hear the government's view on that. Right, thank you. Um, no, certainly I think these are good submissions. They raise very valid points. And um, uh, I note Daniel Johnson's um, suggestion that we send the submissions with the points raised to the uh, Cabinet Secretary and the Scottish Government for comment. Are we agreed to do that? Thank you. Yeah. And in response to Liam Kerr's uh, question, initial question. Yeah, just um, to update the member and the committee, in a brief look we've been able to, to do of the um, Chancellor's spring statement. There is reference to increased police funding, uh, but that's more to tackle crime in England and Wales. There's no specific reference to police pensions or the issue about um, uh, funding that the, the member raised. So it doesn't appear to have been covered in the Chancellor's spring statement. Um, the committee might want to be aware that that particular instrument, the police pensions regulations, comes into force on the 1st of April. So the committee wouldn't be able to look at that one for a second uh, time, given that the committee's not meeting next week. Um, the legal aid instrument uh, comes into force on the 26th of April. So there is time were you to wish to look at that again, but that's a matter for the committee. Okay, Liam MacArthur. Uh, just um, an additional point, I'd, I'd um, note that the Law Society has also made a, a number of technical observations in relation to the, the, the SI, and I wonder whether it's, it's worth getting clarification. They, they, they indicate they were um, due to speak directly to officials, um, whether or not all of the technical observations they've made are, are valid and, and the, the, the government likely to take those on board. I'm, I'm not sure, but it would certainly be helpful, I think, to, to understand the extent to which um, there's been a kind of meeting of minds between the Law Society and officials yeah. on that. The members have raised um, all very valid points, which um, I think we're all agreed is that the case that these are all taken up with the Cabinet Secretary and the Scottish Government, and we look forward to a response. So is it the committee's position that whilst it doesn't want to make any recommendations in re relation to the instrument, it will certainly does want to, to put the questions and the points that we've raised um, to the Cabinet Secretary and the Government? Agreed. Thank you. Uh, that concludes the public part of today's meeting. There, are no, there will be no committee meeting next week. Members of the committee will undertake a fact-finding visit to the Scottish Crime Campus at Gertkosh in North Lanarkshire. Therefore, the next formal meeting of the committee will be on Tuesday 2nd of April, when we expect to begin the process of considering Stage 2 amendments to the Management of Offenders Scotland Bill. We now move into private session.